Homeschooling, no matter the mode or method, takes time. But where do you find the time as a busy mom, especially if you have lots of children? Hi there, mommies. This is Sherry Hayes with MomDelights.com. And today I want to share something that adds to your life. So go ahead and wash your dishes and play with your babies or whatever you have to do. And listen as we dig into the good life in Jesus. Okay, so today we're going to talk about disciplines that help you find the time. Or maybe looking at it from a different direction. Because people usually understand about relying on God's direction for the big things like finances or your vocation, who you're going to marry, and etc. and so on and so forth, right? But as a homeschooling mom of 15, God has had me in a stricter school, okay, of trusting Him for each minute of each day. <laughs> Remember, I'm the mom of 15. I've been homeschooling for over three decades. <laughs> so I'm not a newbie. Um, and he had to give me the lessons of trusting him over and over again. I've been in this school, right? Now, why are there so many lessons that he's had for me? I think it's because I love to be in control. And I really admire people who look like their life is handled, you know, like not a hair out of place. They're car is clean, their nails are clean, <laughs> and it just looks like they've got systems and everything's in place. And um, I, I really admire that, and I actually uh, have followed people online that look like they had it all together, haven't you? I mean, don't you, I mean, nobody likes to necessarily watch someone who is as frazzled as you are. <laughs> so when, back when we were just doing blogging, Remember, it was before YouTube and Instagram and everything. Uh, and homeschool moms, they just did the blogging thing. Well, I befriended a fellow blogger, and we shared back and forth a little bit. And it looked like to me like she had everything in order. I mean, it just, like, I admired so much all of her systems and everything, and she had pictures and advice. And then, so we kind of struck up a conversation, and we got to know one another, and she opened up to me. And she had some real concerns in her life because these systems that she had put in place, they were kind of breaking down because, you know, life has stuff happen and it's unpredictable. And she had children that weren't following along with, with her system and things were falling apart. And, and she was really having a struggle. And I knew this is God teaching her the same lessons he's been teaching me. <laughs> and so... um. There are actually, I think, two kind of camps. Now, this is not, like, exhaustive, okay? There's lots of different things. But to my mind, there are kind of like two camps of people that look like they have it together, okay? The first camp is, like, order is like an idol in their life. But you don't usually find people in this camp who will homeschool or have lots of kids. Not generally. Because that would interrupt with their plans. Lots of these people who have order as an idol, they def they they generally don't even have kids or pets. <laughs> and if they do, you know, it's like, because, you know, order is everything to them. Okay, so that's where it's an idol. And I think some of us can actually do that, even if we do have these other things in our lives. And then the other camp are those who couldn't describe how they became orderly. Because it was a side note to loving God and loving others. It's like things fall into place for them because that's like part of their life, but it's an expression of their love for God and other people. So here's my life story. And you may relate to this. Because just when I feel I am on top of things, something happens to derail my plans and my systems. Now... I don't think I'm alone. I think you. I think you've had this happen to you before. Like I don't. My husband always kind of laughs because I'll have this system and I'll have it, you know. And you're going to go over here. Then you're going to do this, and then he's going to do that, and you know. And I'll have lists of all the things and everything. And then something will happen. Like we'll go on for a little while. I mean, we can even go on for a month or two. And at a certain point, I even get bored of it. <laughs> no, but really, things tend. If someone gets sick. Uh, you know, like, or we have to move, or something would happen, and then everything would fall to pieces. You know, um, it happens even, it happened the last couple weeks. It happened this last winter a lot. <laughs> now, I know God loves me too much 
to allow me to rely on some false idea of my own competence. Right? His plan is to train me to become solely reliant on him. Now, looking back in old journals, this becomes glaringly apparent, okay, because I, you know, like I kept track of our homeschooling, and I can see, I remember times that we were going through different things, like health issues, a new baby, all that kind of stuff, and I felt like I, like I was just like, whatever, I was just doing the next thing, I wasn't really having any great plans, I couldn't plan, I couldn't, I wasn't on top of things, and yet, I look back in my journals, and those were some of the most productive days I've ever had. Why? Because God was taking care of me. I had to rely, because I had to rely totally on God's grace. It wasn't about me at all. It was about Him. Now, here's the truth, okay? God is a God of order. Can we agree on that? We can look at, I mean, this eyeball that's looking at you through this camera this eyeball was created by a God of order. Is that true? Wherever he has been, wherever he has been allowed to have preeminence, there is not only order, but the beauty of goodness. Just think about the flowers, the field, and the trees, and the mountains, and the birds who fly. That's the beauty of goodness, I think. And here's the greatest part. Becoming totally dependent on God for even the basic tasks of life allows one to become so humble that it moves God's heart with compassion and every little effort on our part is divinely multiplied like the loaves and fishes. Remember, when Jesus fed the 5,000. Okay, so let me read a scripture for this. In Isaiah 57... Verse 15, there's something very profound, and I love this verse. It says this, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a, con a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So here's God in his high and lofty place. And yet, he dwells with those who are humble and contrite. So relying God on every, for every little minute, every little thing in your life, I, I don't want to talk about, I, I don't want to make it sound like it's um, burdensome, like you can't think your own thoughts. That's what I'm saying. But having a heart that's dependent on him, it moves him with compassion for us. Because we're humbling ourselves before him. And then the efforts we do make, even if they're not really that smart, God multiplies those efforts and he covers us with his grace. And things end up working out better in the end. If we had tried and we had all the systems and printed out the things from the internet and had all the boxes filled in and all of them checked, you know? <laughs> okay. Uh, and Paul the Apostle had gone through this school as well. Here is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So, our weakness, when we're at our weakest point, then God steps in and He, bec he becomes strong on our behalf. Now, you know, Paul went through all these different kinds of things. He talked about being in need and having distresses and all these things. And if, if there's anything a mama who has lots of little kids knows, it's about distresses. <laughs> these those precious little people. There are just times when I, I, I would have so many little tiny kids at the same time. And there were just certain times when they would all cry at the same time. <laughs> and I would sing this little song. Oh, it's crying time again. da 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 dee dee that. Just, you know, to, to kind of, uh, shall I say, 
dull the uh, a tendency to become frustrated, I would just sing, and I would sing little songs to them, and you understand where I'm coming from. Okay, there have been seasons when I had kids at home who were in college and had jobs, which I was driving many of them to and from, and while I was pregnant or nursing or teaching some to read, others algebra, and was responsible for a clean house, laundry, meals, and the health and welfare of everybody. And without a total dependency on God, I was headed for disaster. <laughs> it's not wrong to assess and plan your days. It's not wrong. Or to have a few systems in place. That's, that's probably smart, okay? But it is wrong to rely solely on those plans. It's kind of like you hold it all very loosely. You have to have some kind of plan. If you don't plan, then you're planning for a disaster. That's what they say. But within those plans, hold them very loosely and allow God to help you navigate through those plans or make them very general and let him work out the details. <laughs> okay, each day I write down the particulars in a journal, right? And I like if I have appointments or times I'm driving people or chores that need to be done, but always with the understanding that I am trusting him for the outcomes and I am inviting him into the nitty-gritty of my life. Okay, I stand in my kitchen and I often say, okay, Lord, what should I do next? <laughs> and then I just move forward and he leads me and guides me. And it's so neat to watch how he will bless me and take care of the little things. And like one thing maybe maybe fell through, but it's because another thing he wanted to bless me with. And he just this over and over again. He just blesses me. Okay. There and this is a saying that it's kind of like that everybody says, okay, there there are always enough hours in the day when we give those hours to the Lord. <laughs> so here are some scriptures I want to leave you with, like to meditate on, and I will be reading them aloud. And you can write them down or you can listen to this um, on repeat. And uh, you can just bless you and you can think about that. So the first I want to read is Psalm 31, 14 through 20. And it says this. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant. Save me for your mercy's sake. Do not let me be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon you. Let the wicked be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak insolent things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you, in the presence of the sons of men. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence, from the plots of man. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion, from the strife of tongues. Isn't that righteous? Okay, the next verse I want, the, the next passage I want to read to you is in Isaiah. And it's Isaiah 40, and I've got to go to it page. <laughs> it's Isaiah verse 40, verse 31, and it says this, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's good. And the last one will be from Psalm 127, verses 1 through 2. And it says this, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. And so, now with that, I'd like to read to you some commentary on Psalm 127 from Charles Spurgeon. So, in particular, I want to concentrate on verse 2 in Spurgeon's commentary. And this is the Treasury of David. It's a commentary of Charles Spurgeon on the Psalms, and you can find this for free on the internet. And it's really, really a treasury. <laughs> okay, sorry. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit a plate, to eat the bread of sorrows, 
And this is what I want to read. Because the Lord is mainly to be rested in, all carking care is mere vanity and vexation of spirit. We are bound to be diligent, for this the Lord blesses. We ought not to be anxious, for that dishonors the Lord and can never secure his favor. Some deny themselves needful rest. The morning sees them rise before they are rested. The evening sees them toiling long after the curfew has told the knell of parting day. They threaten to bring themselves into the sleep of death by neglect of the sleep which refreshes life. Nor is their sleeplessness the only index of their daily fret. They stint themselves in their meals. They eat the commonest of food and the smallest possible quantity of it. And what they do swallow is washed down with the salt tears of grief, for they fear that daily bread will fail them. Hard earned is their food, scantily rationed and scarcely ever sweetened, but perpetually smeared with sorrow, and all because they have no faith in God, and find no joy except in hoarding up the gold which is their only trust. Not thus, not thus would the Lord have his children live. He would have them, as princes of the blood, lead a happy and restful life. Let them take a fair measure of rest and a due portion of food, for it is for their health. Of course, the true believer will never be lazy or extravagant. If he should be, he will have to suffer for it, but he will not think it needful or right to be worried and miserly. Faith brings calm with it and banishes the disturbers who both by day and by night murder peace. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Through faith, the Lord makes his chosen ones to rest in him in happy freedom from care. The text may mean that God gives blessings to his beloved in sleep, even as he gave Solomon the desire of his heart while he slept. And Solomon was the author of Psalm 127. Uh, the meaning is much the same. Those whom the Lord loves are delivered from the fret and fume of life and take a sweet repose upon the bosom of their Lord. He rests them, blesses them while resting, blesses them more in resting than others in their moiling and toiling. God is sure to give the best thing to his beloved, and he and we here see that he gives them sleep, that is, a laying aside of care, a forgetfulness of need, a quiet leaving of matters with God. This kind of sleep is better than riches and honor. Note how Jesus slept amid the hurly-burly of a storm at sea. He knew that he was in his Father's hands, and therefore he was so quiet in spirit that the billows rocked him to sleep. It would be much oftener the same with us if we were more like him. It is to be hoped that those who built Solomon's temple were allowed to work at it steadily and joyfully. Surely such a house was not built by unwilling laborers. One would hope that the workmen were not called upon to hurry up in the morning, nor to protract their labors far into the night. But we would fain believe that they went on steadily, resting duly, and eating their bread with joy. So, at least, should the spiritual temple be erected. Though, truth to tell, the workers upon its walls are all too apt to grow cumbered with much serving, all too ready to forget their Lord, and to dream that the building is to be done by themselves alone. How much happier might we be if we would but trust the Lord's house to the Lord of the house? What is far more important? How much better would our building and watching be done if we would but confide in the Lord who both builds and keeps his own church? And you could say, the Lord who both builds and keeps our own home. <laughs> so, um, I know we have to balance all that with having certain requirements that we must get done each day. But you can see that you don't have to try to worry about fitting everything in by, you know, charting out each minute. You just have to have the general idea of what you want to get done and then trust God to help you get that done in His good time and in His good pleasure. <laughs> and then you will be able to laugh at the days to come. So, I am still working on our commonplace book. I have been putting color to it and I posted like a little preview as I'm working through it on the community and I thank you so much for all the sweet encouragement I've received and I will keep you abreast as we move forward. We're getting closer to actually putting at least one of the books together. <laughs> it just takes so much work when you're doing actual 
art and you're not relying on a lot of clip art. It takes a little more time, but it's so fun. It's worth it. And I know the end product. I know you're going to love it. So anyway, we'll keep you abreast of that. And please like and subscribe and smack bells and, and put stars and all those wonderful things. And you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. <laughs>